You know, you guys have changed up some stuff since I've been away. Like, the screen, like, there's a lot of different things going on, like, trying to get used to everything. And you like it. Uh, It's it's nice, though. It's nice. You know what I mean? Y'all can see it. I can't see it, so. (laughs) All right. It is right here. You're right. Bruce, like, Paris, it's in your face. (laughs) All right. Good morning, church. All right. How y'all feeling? Man, it's good to see everybody. Look at you guys. Oh, oh, looking looking good, looking happy. It's good to see people, man. All right, well, we're going to continue our journey in the book of Acts. There we go. All right, we're going to be in Acts, and today we are in Acts 13. November 13th, we are in chapter 13, right? That, that's the, the, the sequencing is important there. So, yeah, thank you guys so much for those who were praying for me. I do want to kind of minimize some of the concerns. I know I went to the ER Sunday, and I think everyone was like, oh, my goodness, what happened, right? But I, it wasn't really that bad. I, I knew that I was sick. I knew I had an infection, and I just needed to go there to get medication. That, that's really why, that's kind of the reason why I was like, I just knew it was, it was serious. But I, was, I could breathe. The, the ambulance didn't come. There was no resuscitation, all right? I was good. It was just, had to get that checked out and um, it worked it out. But yeah, it was a, it was a combination of, you know, a respiratory infection, a laryngitis. And then I think I actually got COVID and didn't even know it. Uh, but I think the COVID thing happened a long time previous because the only reason I noticed something was up and it probably was COVID because I was telling my doctor, I'm like, whenever I eat anything that has sugar in it, it tastes metallic so I can't eat anything with sugar in it and I'll tell you now I still can't eat anything with sugar in it do y'all know how hard it is to not eat something with sugar in it has anyone tried to like stay away from sugar do you know that sugar (laughs) someone said no (laughs) Why would I do that? Who does that? Why'd I do that at? You know, sugar is literally in everything. Like, that's, why is that? Does, does anyone know why sugar in everything? I, I really, I need to hear, go ahead. Why? why is, because, <laughs> okay, well, I mean, okay, because it's addictive, then that's like saying, look, we'll put crack in stuff because it's addictive. Like, come on. Like, okay, that was, right, that was a little extreme. That was extreme. That was extreme. Those on Zoom, we're not prescribing to this. You know, I'm still we're on some medication. Y'all got to be gracious. <laughs> oh, it's two different things. It's two different, two different things. I got it. Like, <laughs> oh, we missed you, Paris. We miss you so much. <laughs> oh, man. So I guess definitely it's addictive. I can see that as being a reason, right? But what else? Okay, sweet. I mean, that's, I just, oh, go ahead, see, why don't you? Oh, okay. That's, that's a good, go ahead. Uh, gives you your dopamine hit. Got it, got it. Okay, okay. Now, this, this isn't part of the dopamine. sermon. This is just us talking right now. I'm sorry. People I just, had, I just wanted to ask. I'm like, man, I got to figure this out. Like, it is like everything, everything. My wife made me a grilled cheese sandwich. I'm like, it's just bread and cheese. Why is there sugar in this? This bread has sugar in it. Like, I'm like, what is this? So it has been an interesting life. I guess it's good for my health, but man, I tell you. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about what I've learned through this time. But we are in Acts 13. And let's get back to the sermon, right? All the shenanigans. I'm sorry, Zoom people. Apologize. (laughs) I'm back, all right? And so, as we get ready to explore Acts 13, there's a couple things I want us to kind of tie into. You know, at this point in the book of Acts, as we've been going through this journey, studying out Acts, you know, at this point, many theologians say that uh, this is where the book actually transitions from the Acts of the Apostles to really the Acts of Paul. Uh, like you really see a clear transition moving forward from 13 on where the the dominant figure uh, in the book of Acts really becomes Paul. 
And the light is now off the Jerusalem apostles and it shifts to this recently converted, right? Radical rabbi named Saul of Tarsus. And so now we're gonna really be digging into who Saul is uh, and his journey. And it's interesting because actually in chapter 13 is the first time we actually hear his name change from Saul to Paul, right? Where people start calling him Paul, pretty much in moving forward, we'll, we'll know him as Paul. But in Acts 5, it was really clear with this transition from Jerusalem on to Antioch, right? In Acts 5, they said, the people, when they were accusing the apostles and they were, they were, they were charging the apostles, they said, you have filled Jerusalem with your gospel. And so because they have filled Jerusalem with their gospel, it was like, we need to persecute the church. And then we talked about the persecution of the church, and that's what caused the scattering of the church, what caused the planting of all these different mission journeys in the church of Antioch. But I thought that was such an interesting statement. You have filled Jerusalem with the gospel. Can you imagine? I wish... I could hear them say, you have filled Mercer County with the gospel, right? Like you have filled New Jersey with the gospel. You know, and as I, as I said, we're in, we're looking at this church in Antioch that was founded by ordinary disciples. Uh, this Antioch is in Syria. It's not the one in Turkey. There are two Antiochs that we'll see in the book of Acts. One's in Syria. One's in Turkey, modern-day Turkey, what we call now modern-day Turkey. Uh, but before we get into 13, I want to kind of give us a little reminder of some things that we explored early on in the book of Acts, especially when we talk about what does it mean to be, or what, is it, what does it mean, what does the word church mean, right? We talked about this before. We talked about ecclesia, right? The word ecclesia, and that's where we get the word church from. And typically, I don't know, at this pop quiz, who remembers this? Our modern definition of church being a place that people go to for worship, where, what word and what language is that more likened to? Does anyone remember that word that we used? German. It is a German word. Number to you, Kirk, there we go. Who said there we go? Kirk, right? That's the more, that's that German, is, 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 and that actually meant a, a location that people will go to practice religious ceremonies. But that's not the biblical definition of church. The biblical definition of church is ecclesia, and it's about the called out ones, those who have been called out, and we likened it more to a movement. A lot of people, when they view church, they think of a place that I go to. They don't think of a movement of people that are unified behind an idea and are going somewhere to make sure that this happens, right? And so we got to remember that the church is not a place, it's the people. We shouldn't say I'm going to church, technically, right? I actually kind of, that's why, that's somewhere where the confusion comes from, I'm going to church. What, what should we say? Okay, <laughs> I'm going to worship God, I What's the other thing? What do you think we could say? Like it, oh, okay, I'm going to practice. Okay, all right. Go ahead, what did you say, Reed? Okay, going to meet with the church, that's a good one. <laughs> She's like, I was in, you took my thing, you took my thing. You know, I'm going to a place where the church will be gathered together, right? Huh? I'm going to a place of what? Meeting, there we go, right? and, and actually, that's in line with what they shared in Acts. You know, we're going to the meeting place. That's what, we, that's what they said, we're going to a meeting place. But see, we, we get this thing twisted, right? Church for us is, it's a location, it's a building, it's a place, right? And buildings are cool. It's, you know, Central's buying a building, so I ain't, I ain't against buildings, right? You know what I mean? Like, Johnny, that's what's up. All I'm saying is, <laughs> the church is about the people. It's the movement. Where are we going? What are we doing? It's important for us to remember this as we get ready to jump into uh, chapter 13. You've got a group of people who've been called, we've been called out of our homes to meet together, to be inspired and to worship. And then 
be sent back out on mission. That's what this is for. Come together to be inspired, to worship, and then to be sent back out on mission. Right? Start, and this, we see this really clearly in the church of Antioch. It starts off here in the church of Antioch. It's a little church started by ordinary disciples that went off the Jewish grid, right? They went to more, you know, foreign territory, uh, into a non-Jew city, non-Jewish city, and they went there because they were avoiding persecution, right? They were being fired from their jobs, being, you know, laid off, being persecuted, ultimately being stoned, as we saw with Stephen. And so, and all this stuff was started by Saul, and as we shared a few weeks ago, the irony of it all was the church of Antioch, ended up being the very church that did what? Sent Paul out on mission, right? So let's start off in verse one. And uh, as I go through this, I'm gonna be sharing some stuff, so just roll with me on it, all right? This is really interesting, and I love this, because we see the church of Antioch really like exemplifying what it means to be a church on mission. And so in verse one, it says this. Now the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, son of encouragement. Uh, and Barnabas is also from Cyprus. And uh, we're going to notice that that's actually the first place that they send the mission team off to, uh, which makes sense. They got someone who's from there to kind of lead that, that off. And then we got Simon called Niger, which means black. And this is interesting with Simon. Simon actually was African, one of the first missionaries that was sent out. And not only was he African, he was actually Simon of Cyrene. And if you guys remember, now this is, people have tied this in. Who was Simon of Cyrene? He was the guy that after Jesus was carrying the cross and he couldn't carry it no longer, that guy that had to pick it up and finish and carry the cross all the way was a black man that finished that journey. And now he's a disciple in Antioch going on mission with Barnabas and helping to plant that church as a teacher and apostle there, right? The other guy, Lucius from Cyrene, another African that was a part of the church in Antioch. You know, and so you see a really diverse group, but not only do you have Lucius there, you have this guy named Manin, and it says that he had been brought up with Herod. This is interesting. Right? Like I said, all these guys have an interesting backstory. But guess, when we talk about Herod, and if you guys remember we, when I did the sermon, the sermon series in Mark a while ago, this is for the OG members, when we did Mark, and remember we talked about this stuff with Herod and his, his, his family, right? And how many <laughs> there, there were, right? This Herod, when it says he's been brought up with, is a... Uh, is interesting because it actually means that that was his foster brother. This was Herod's foster brother. And the Herod that he's talking about is, the, is Herod of Antipas, who murdered John the Baptist. Herod of Antipas, who murdered John the Baptist. And he all, not only did he murder John, but what else did he do? This same Herod, yeah, he tried Jesus. So the foster brother of the man that beheaded John the Baptist and tried Jesus is a disciple in the Antioch church about to go on mission. You know, this is, y'all see this, this, this crew? It's a diverse, interesting group of people that are going on mission, Right? And it's funny how you could be born in the same house and make two totally different decisions, right? Any of y'all know that? <laughs> Some of y'all like, Psh. <laughs> I know that too well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, born in the same house, two drastically different paths. Drastically different paths. That's a sermon for another story, but sermon for another day. But in verse 2, it goes on. And it says, as they ministered to the Lord, which that there is interesting. As they ministered to the Lord and fasting, 
the Holy Spirit set set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. I do want to pause on this statement. Uh, again, they were ministering to the Lord. It's a really interesting statement there that it says that they were ministering to the Lord. It does not say that they were ministering for the Lord. It does not say that they were ministers of the Lord. It says that they were ministering to the Lord. It's a Greek word, letorgio. That's how I say it. It's a word that we get. Could anyone think they could figure out the association here? Liturgy. There you go. Look at y'all. Y'all some. You know what I mean? Y'all some sharp, sharp disciples. <laughs> Liturgy. And really, liturgy, another word for that is worship. And some translations say worship. You probably read in a translation that says worship, right? I just look, everyone's like, okay, all right. They're like, I don't know what you were saying right there. <laughs> I don't know what translation you read, bro. Then people was confused. I got you. I got you, you know? But it's interesting to kind of tie this in real quick because it says something, you know, when you, you kind of go more to the root word of it where it says here that they were ministering to the Lord, that exact word, the exact word, you could translate translate it to worship, but the exact word is minister to. And this is what the priest would do. The priest would come and they would give a liturgy, right? Similar to what I'm doing. Like I'm giving a message. I'm I'm encouraging you guys and and sharing sharing the word, right? And, you know, think of this anytime. For those who have have done anything up front, they've, they've shared a word, led a discussion, sing, you know, sung a song and you ever heard someone say, man, you just, you just ministered to me. What you did, what you just said, that ministered to my heart. Man, when you sung that song, that ministered, that word you just shared, that, that, that blessed me. You ever heard anyone say that? Y'all said that. I know y'all say that. Y'all say it all the time. You know what I mean? Like, this is, this is part of our vernacular. We say stuff like that. Man, what you, you said, what, what you, what you just shared, man, that, that ministered to my heart. Man, you blessed me when you sang that song. You know, like, we share these things. Now, imagine God saying to you after your worship, man, what you just did minister to me. Man, you just, you just blessed me. You know, I love what our sister Andrea was sharing because I think that sometimes we forget um, that we're here to worship God. But even what we do is even bigger than that. Like, we're ministering to God. Like, our worship is ministering to God. It's blessing God. You know, and I thought this was powerful for me. And I know this is a side note. This ain't even really, like, a big thing in here. But it was it was just an interesting component because I think sometimes as disciples, we get caught up in the routine and the mundaneness of what we do consistently. And we forget you're singing you're ministering to God. You're engaging in the word. That's ministering to God. You know, when you think of that in terms of worship, it changes how you worship. It really changes how you worship. You know, when people say, oh, I don't feel like worshiping. I'm, I don't feel like that's not my thing. I'm not. I'm like, OK, that's cool. But it's not about you. It's not about you. It's supposed to be about him. And so it says, as they ministered to the Lord, focused on him, speaking to him, you know, this was big. You know, people love to come to a location where people worship, right, the church. They love to come, and they're looking to be given to all the time. People want to be given to. I'm coming to be, to be, to be served. I'm coming to, to hear the word. I'm coming to to be given this, you know what I mean? And I'm like, man, is that the way God intended? Is that what we're here to do? No, we're here to, that's that's not the goal of church. The church is not a commodity. The church is an experience that we're all partaking a part of, you know? And so I thought this was really, really heavy. And the reality is this, look, if you get fed, if you get instructed, uh, that's awesome. (laughs) 
Amen. You know, that is the goal. But if you have a heart to abandon yourself and focus on God, my sermon could be hot garbage. And I guarantee you'll get something out of it. I just, when you have, it's all about the heart that you come in with. The worship could be like all off key, like not even a key. You know what I mean? They all, they all some other tip. It could be some other thing, but you, you just, you hear singing with them. You just singing off key, sounding horrible. Like just you, you, you there. Why? Because it's not about them. It's about him. And I think it's, those things become big when it's not about him anymore. It's about what am I getting from you? And I think it's important to have the right perspective when you come into worship. You know, I don't know why you was all in my notes, but I just had to run with that one. It just matched the communion. <laughs> you know, you should ask yourself, what did I offer God today? What did I offer God today? You know, can you imagine God saying, today your worship blessed me? You're singing, you're sharing, you're preaching, your encouragement, your engagement with others, your service, your love, your consideration, your participation. Those things blessed me today. You know, Psalms, uh, David writes in Psalms 34, he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth. You know, I know it's hard to think of it that way because we expect the blessings to come from where? From him. We tend to forget that we are equally capable of not just blessing others, but blessing our Heavenly Father through our worship. You know, that's a free side note. Let's get back to this missionary heart. So God is a missionary God. He's a missionary God. He's all about mission. He's always been about sending his people out. In Genesis, he told Abraham to get up and what? Go. Go to this foreign place. You ain't never been before. Uh, Why? Because you are going to be, he said, he told him that the nations will be blessed through you. So I want you to go. Always an interesting thing. God's missionary, right? So we had to go. Jesus was a missionary. He came down from heaven to seek and save the lost, right? That was his goal, to seek and save the lost. And then we see the Holy Spirit is equally just as mission-minded, right? Because the Holy Spirit is sending people out. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you out. The goal is to bless the world through the gospel. And if you are not being sent on mission, you're becoming spiritually obese. If you're not actively engaging others with the gospel, if you're not actively sharing with other people what God has been given to you, you're becoming spiritually obese. And you got to think of it this way. You eating all day, but you ain't doing nothing with that. You can eat good stuff, but if you're just sitting on your behind all day, what's going to happen? (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Professor. (laughs) You know, it's true. It's not good. And look, reality is this. A lot of us have been doing that. We've been getting fed by the word, been intaking all this stuff, coming to church, doing all this. But guess what? We ain't talking to no one about this. We're not sharing this good news with anyone else. We're not engaging people who don't know God. We're not engaging people who think they know God. We're not engaging people who even know God about with God's word. We just eating, 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 and getting obese. Not exercising. Being filled, but never being sent. Being a churchgoer, but not being a disciple. The Holy Spirit sent out his people. And the first stop was Cyprus. So let's continue on in verse 6. It says, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. 
There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar Jesus, who was an attendant of the who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, proconsul is like a governor, not a big governor, like a, more like kind of more like a mayor, you know, in that sense. Um, but yeah. Intelligent man, he sent for Barabbas and Saul because he wanted to hear from, hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, there we go, first time we see it, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight into Elymas and said, I love you. Because that's what you say when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, right? You're, you're awesome. Verse 10, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You will never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. And you are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately a mist of darkness, a mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw this, saw what had happened, he believed. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> for he was amazed at the teachings of the Lord, about the Lord. I want to give five minutes. I want you guys to turn and talk to each other. What are some things that stood out to you about that section of scripture we just read? What do you think the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about that section of scripture we just read? So just turn to, you can talk to a group of you guys around and I want to give five minutes for that. You know, we this is like our practice now. Before I share my thoughts, I want you guys to share yours.
Hell yeah. Let's uh, let's pull this in. I want to I want to join in on some of this. What? So, what's some of the insight that you guys kind of pulled from these different? First, they would like to speak. Oh, the, the first, oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh my gosh. You know something that stood out to me, and we were talking about is that how, um, in essence, Please. Paul was coming against. Um, this magician who was trying to turn people from the faith. And that is something I thought about because even right now, there's so much going on. So many people are saying things to get Christians to abandon their faith. Mm. And how bold am I to be like, you deceitful, you devil, <laughs> you know. And then y'all be hearing, you know, I'll be canceled. But, um, but to really like, have that boldness because yeah. it's beyond me. It's not about yep. me. It's about yep. God's mission. It's about, you know, faith and, and, and the gospel. So mm. that's something that's... That's great. Great point. Great point. Anyway. Yeah, in our discussion, I really appreciated what Mark said is that, well, Paul had been there. Mm. You know, Paul had been blinded by the spirit. Paul mm. had been knocked off the horse. Paul had been persecuting the church. Paul had been there. Yep. And, you know, Paul took the discipline from God as love. Yep. And, you know, sometimes it's just good to take a step back and say, hey, you know, Paul was telling, speaking the truth in love to this man. Mm. You know, perhaps, you know. sometimes when you read something, you hear it the way you think he might have said it. But the truth is, he probably said it with a lot of compassion. Because mm. he knew what the man was suffering. And, uh, you know, and he knew that the blindness might lead to his redemption. Mm. You know, not necessarily yeah, his yeah. condemnation. No, that's good. That's so, good. you know, it's, it's really when you... It is really an amazing story. I never would have thought of it that way. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. All of in my notes. Go ahead. As usual. That's, that's, that's the thing. When I open this stuff up, y'all just take my whole sermon from me. Go for it. <laughs> um, I think to add on to what she was saying, um, I think sometimes we don't realize that um, we can look at our background instead of just obey the spirit. You mm. know, because... Paul just got called, you know, Saul was just called Paul, right? We just learned that his name just changed. Yeah. And so he could have, you know, said, well, who am I to call out the devil and somebody else when I'm still, didn't matter. At some point he decided, <laughs> I'm going to obey. This is true. This is real. And uh, my husband had a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you got to speak. Uh, so I was relating a story that I have a coworker who's going through a hard time, but at the same time, he's also making a lot of bad decisions. Mm. And I, I have taken the tack that I was going to be like a supportive comrade as he's going through this rough time. But I have not called out his sin at all. You mm. know? He, he claims to be a believer as well. It's like, I was like, wow, like it, it makes a statement to say that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit mm. and challenged him directly on what he was doing and, and what it was. And I was just wondering like, man, like, like what spirit am I following as I'm like, and I, I understand it can be both. Sometimes yeah. you gotta be supportive. Sometimes you gotta challenge, but like, I'm, I'm, you know, to be honest, 
I want to be accepted, and that's why I'm mm. challenging But that's, um, you know, but it, it definitely challenged me on that. But also, like, uh, again, to touch on, I, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Elaine, and Elaine's point, Paul, when Paul was converted, like, God sent, and I'm drawing a blank on the name, but he sent somebody and said, lead him by the hand. Yeah. And when this guy was blinded, he was reaching out his hand for someone to <laughs> Yeah. Him. And I, I, didn't, I didn't make that connection. Uh, but, yeah. But yeah, and then uh, there were some other things with my pride. The pressure. I no, that's know. great. That's great. No, that's, that, that, yeah. thanks for being honest with that. That's some good stuff. Good stuff. Um, I agree with everything that everyone is saying. And, and obviously the challenge for all in our discussion was, who are we? And, mm. You know, when we focus on ourselves and our, and our shortcoming. But what I realize is, if it's what our own child, do we focus on our own shortcoming to correct and love our child and mm. child, children and, and, and show them the way? So, yeah. you know, we won't hold back. We won't even focus on what we've done when it's one of our own children. Yeah. So that's the same thing with God. Wow. This is something that we will go and do it. That's a great point. That's a great analogy. Yep. That's really good. So when I was reading about the intelligent man, I just liked how <laughs> it was like the description, the intelligent man. Yeah. Right? And he sends specifically for Barnabas and Saul. So if you're intelligent, you know, you're weighing the pros and cons. Right. So yeah. he's like, I know the sorcerer. I heard about Saul and Paul. I want to hear it from them because I can clearly see how he's an intelligent man. And he's like, okay, what turned Saul to Paul? Mm. He went from persecuting to preaching and being the voice of the church. Yeah. So as an intelligent person, I'd be like, I want to hear from you. What yeah. changed your heart? Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's what I was thinking. Yeah. And then, I, and then he saw someone get blinded and he's like, okay. <laughs> Say less. <laughs> All right, we got a couple more in the back. We'll take, we'll take, we'll take two more. <laughs> and just, just a side note, even with uh, this name change with Paul, I know for us, we kind of liken it to uh, Peter's name change, but it's not like that at all, actually. Uh, Saul was given his name Paul on the ninth day of his, when he was born because his father was a Roman citizen. So uh, Paul is his Roman name. Um, so he was called Paul since he was a child. Uh, yeah. And so Saul, Saul, Saul is what they called him at home. But, you know, y'all know how that is. Some of y'all, some of we got, we got at home, they call us this. But, you know, on the streets, this is what you call me. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so it wasn't, a, it, was, it was more, it more spoke to like culturally. And even his transition to using Paul is a big statement, though, because it shows I'm going to the Gentiles. Like, I'm, I, you know, my Hebrew name is Saul, but I'm, I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm Paul. Like, I'm assimilating into this space so I could win them over, you know. So I just wanted to put that out there. So um, I just wanted to share that um, what, what um, I get from this is basically that God is saying that there are souls out there that want to be saved, that want to know God. Mm -hmm. And um, there are things out there, you know, fighting for their souls as well, you mm. know, pulling them from God. And this is saying that we have the power. Yep. We have the power to like fight that, you know, to like win those souls to overcome all the obstacles that are put forth to stop God from, you know, penetrating in that soul. And mm. that's what mm. I get from this. Great point. Great point. We definitely gonna talk a little more about it. one more and then we'll wrap. Let's get right up here. Cause then I ain't gonna have nothing to preach after y'all done took everything. I ain't gonna have nothing to say. You know? <laughs> so this was actually going back to verse six. Um, I noticed that they said that they uh, met with the Jewish sorcerer, but they also met with the false prophet Bar Jesus, who was the attendant to the proconsul. Yeah. However, so it, that's telling me there was a relationship, a trusted relationship, and and but at the same time, the proconsul still sought help and knew that okay, because of this 
close and tight relationship with this attendant, you know, who's under me or uh, Mm -hmm. with me or whatever like that, that I could be compromised in my faith. And I think sometimes we do have to watch out for even those relationships Mm. that are close and tight Mm. and that we actually admire the advice uh, of an input from people that are close to us that it could still be leading us away from Christ. Mm. Mm. Pradikalo, there we go. That's a word. Look, it's funny because you know, you know, even the point you just made up, I thought it was interesting, and that's not my note, not made up, but you just, you, you. <laughs> you didn't make it up. The point that you pulled from the scriptures and your observation, I told y'all this medication is just wearing a little bit. Y'all need to be patient with me, all right? <laughs> oh, man. But it's it's interesting because they're clearly what they were clearly close, right? The intelligent and the pro council and and Bar Jesus were close. It wasn't like when Bar Jesus went blind, he was like, "What'd you do to my boy?" He was like, "I believe you." <laughs> I was like, that was such a quick like you would think it'd be like you just can't blind my guy like this. This is this is my attendant. What are you what are you doing? He was just you could tell the the level of conviction that that whole thing had to have been, it was like, you a bad man, you know what I mean? Like, but I, I do wanna kinda hone in on a couple of things. You guys have highlighted so much, and again, this practice is so good because I want y'all to see how the Holy Spirit speaks to you and speaks through you. Uh, it's really powerful, the stuff that you guys are sharing, man. It says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he looked the man in the eyes and said what he said. To me, I'm like, you know, to to Tim's point, it's hard for us to send a challenge like that. You know, we we tend to think, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, how should you talk to people? No, I'm saying, how how do we feel typically? Let's be, right, loving? Yes, yes, be the nice guy. We're We're the... we were supposed to be loving, accepting. You're, you're cool. not rocking the boat. I'm not trying to cause any, any issues here. I ain't trying to shake anything up. I'm, you know, we good. We good. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, rebuke. What? That's not Holy Spirit, right? Was he harsh? Okay, okay, okay. How about this? How about this? How about this? It sounds like we all, we all all the place. Sounds like y'all ain't confident about y'all answer here. <laughs> How about this? Was Jesus harsh? Ooh, that was good. Was Jesus harsh? I mean, Jesus flipped tables. Jesus chased people around with a whip. He called people hypocrites to their face, right? He, 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 right? <laughs> called people children of the devil. Tell him, get behind me, Satan. He said that stuff. Was Jesus harsh? Oh. (laughs) Okay, okay, say that, say it. Mm -hmm. Truth. Truth. So I would say Jesus was truthful. Mm. I like that. Truth hurts. Mmm. Yes, it does. Go ahead, back there. Go ahead. Mmm. Yeah. harsh. There we go. They heard me. He, they Say heard that me. again. If for the, the people, people on the Zoom, back. it's for the people on Zoom. <laughs> Even though she is in the back, say it for the people in the front. <laughs> I I think in the world where we are, where there's where it's so full of lies, that speaking the truth in general is just harsh. It is. It is. And, and look, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be real. Like, let's be real. Let's be real. We got to remember what this man was doing. Like, I, I think you got to, sometimes we're like, oh, we're focused on what Paul said and how he said it. But I think we're forgetting what this man was actually doing. Right? Whenever you distort the truth. Whenever you manipulate individuals, you are doing the very work that Satan does. 
And you're doing exactly what Satan wants. You know, we think that being filled with the Holy Spirit is going to lead us to share sweet, nice, comforting, and disarming things. That's what we tend to believe. But here's the thing. Here's why we struggle with what Paul did. Because we have a tendency to just be fake. We have a tendency to be fake, even as Christian, spiritual folk, especially spiritual folk, church folk. Let me say spiritual, church folk, church people, sorry. Southern thing coming, folks, I apologize. We can, this is a medication. <laughs> that medication. <laughs> you know, we could be fake. We could be fake. And, and we, we don't want to tell people the truth. We don't say what's real. We could be so fake. We smile in people's face, watching them make wrong, bad, dangerous decisions, listening to people say things that are hurtful, damaging, and we just sit there. Like, we'll sit there like, yeah, wow, that's crazy. What? Oh, man. Oh, yeah, I'm with you. Oh, so fake. We are fake for real. And we'll just watch people over and over again say things, do things that are destructive in their lives. And we know the truth. We know the truth. And we say nothing. I don't want to hurt their feelings. We're so concerned with not hurting feelings that we'll let people damage themselves, hurt themselves, or hurt other people. We don't speak up. Now, and I get this, and I get it. I understand. Like, some of us are like, but do you know what the church has done? You know how right, uh, overly righteous, self-righteous? I get it, man. I've seen that. And you're right. Self-righteous people, they hurt too. They hurt just as bad as your fake behind hurts people. You're no better. You not speaking the truth is just as damaging as the fake person, as the hypocrite or the... Uh, overly self-righteous person is by just judging people you're in the same space so reality is this make a decision is Jesus Lord or are they like we got to stop being fake religious people only say sweet nice things self-righteous people only say judgmental things the Holy Spirit will lead people to say what needs to be said when it needs to be said. So who are you following? And we got to, it's a challenge. It is. It's a challenge. Trust me. I know I could sit down and think through my week. There are some things I probably should have said to some people. I'm sure you thinking through your week. There are some things you probably should have said to some people. But you didn't say it. You didn't say it. You know, we don't allow the Holy Spirit to have free reign with our tongue. But Paul looked this man in his face and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You will never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord. When's the last time a brother or sister in Christ gave you a real challenge? Like for real, when's the last time a brother or sister in Christ gave you a real challenge? When's the last time you gave a brother or sister in Christ a real challenge? See, I know we're, we're real sensitive, you know, in our family at churches, we use this term discipling. You know, and that's kind of becoming an ancient word nowadays. You know, we don't talk about that because we don't, you know, again, we we don't want to hurt people's feelings. We don't want to mess people up. And we've seen the, the self-righteousness in full effect. We've seen how the judgmental attitudes have hurt and damaged people. So we're like, I just will... I'll pray for you, sister. Amen. Brother, brother, I'm going to pray for you. Mm. And that's hard to do. 
You know, and I think it's important to ask ourselves these questions. Like, when's the last time I've even allowed myself to be challenged? Like, we got no problem. Who in here is perfect? Okay. So we all know we're not perfect. Who in here is trying to get better? Okay, except for Alex. He's the only one that didn't raise his hand. And Bruce. <laughs> We're trying to be Alex and Bruce. <laughs> I'm playing. I'm playing. I love y'all. <laughs> you know, I heard this yesterday, and this convicted me so bad. I was like, I was on like my fifth draft of this sermon. I feel like now lately, I don't know what it is. I feel like I just keep rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. I feel like Hamilton. I just keep writing. But, <laughs> you know, like, it's so, <laughs> and so, you know, but I, I, I was listening to something on, online, and man, this convicted me. This brother was, was, was sharing this thing online. He said this. He said, many of us have not been growing spiritually. We get, you know, we get stuck. We're struggling with different things, struggling with anger, bitterness, fear, right? We struggle with all these different things. And the reason that we don't invite people into our lives for correction and he said this, and I thought it was deep. Oh, man, sorry. We're not there. He says, control kills correction. Look, look, control kills correction. I mean, y- y'all need to think about this. Control kills correction all the time. And, you know, when the brother shared, I was like, what? Like, I had to stop and think about that for myself. Control kills correction. We love to be in control. He talked about how LeBron James has a shooting coach, right? Because he needs that, them free throws. Struggling. Serena Williams has a trainer. She has someone that helps her to train, right? And they're paying these people. Like, they're paying them good money. You know what I mean? Good money. Not for suggestions. Not for comforting words. Not for affirmations, right? They're paying them for what? Correction. Like, I want to be corrected. Yes, I'm a skilled basketball player. Yes, I'm one of the best tennis players in the world. But your form was off. You need to stop losing your temper. It caused you to do this. But see, when you feel you are the only one that has control, who could correct you? Who could correct you? See, as a church, we have stopped growing spiritually. As individuals, we have stopped growing spiritually because we don't want to let go of control. We don't want other people's input in our lives. We think I'm going to figure it out myself. I got Google. Whatever problem I run into, I'll figure it out. You know what I mean? Like, I'll, I'll do it myself. That we, We've created this mentality. It's a real American thing, right? Like, we don't believe in the tribe anymore. We don't believe in it takes a community to do things. We really believe, like, I can do all things by myself. We don't invite people in anymore. And what happens when you do that? It shows you want absolute control. Control kills correction. When you're the only voice you respond to, it kills and limits your ability to grow. And so this is what this scripture, when I read through this, this is what it spoke to me. You know, bar Jesus, you know what that word bar means? means son of, son of Jesus, or as Paul called him, son of the devil. I thought that stood out to me. I'm like, your name is the son of Jesus. And then Paul called you a son of the devil. (laughs) That is interesting. I had to stop and think about that a little bit because Many people walk around with the name Christian. 
Many people walk around with the name Christian. Right? I'm good. I'm a Christian. I love God. I'm good. I'm here. But they're not really walking like a Christian. You know, Revelation 3 says this. Jesus tells the church, he says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. He said that to a church. Like a church. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. How does this happen? They lost their first love, okay. It's very spiritual terminology, but give me something more on earth. So I want something more grounded. Go ahead. They were fake. They were acting. And this could happen. Yeah. This did happen to yeah. the church. So. No, that's real. Go ahead, Elaine. Oh, you probably like, might pass to Elaine if you can choose right here. I see, I, I just see it as the great deception that mm. it's so easily to get deceived about where you are. And um, especially when you're the one who's making the decisions and you're not getting any input. Um, or, and you're not, and you, when you do get input, you don't listen to it. So mm. it, it's just, a, it's a deep deception. And that's why we need the spirit to help us discern. Yep. Um, and, uh, yeah. and, oh, go ahead, go ahead. We were talking on the way to church this morning about how, what it, what do they mean? What does Paul and John and Peter mean when they say to fight the world, to, to not take the world on, to mm -hmm. be, uh, don't go as the world goes. And that's a big part of it. The world creeps in. Yep. And when it creeps in, you need to have someone, hey, look, the world's creeping in. You need to get it out of your life. Yeah. That's huge. That's so big. You know, it's, it's interesting. When I, when I had, when I was sitting there kind of meditating on this and like letting this ruminate in my mind, the thing I was literally just talking to Jeff about this, I, what, what actually tripped me up the most was how in the world do you have a prophet Jewish sorcerer? Like that doesn't make any sense. You know, if you know, if you know Jewish culture, there's no way that that would happen. So I was like, I need to dig into this real quick because this doesn't make any sense. That shouldn't, that, 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 these things don't make sense because the Old Testament teaches against sorcery so much. And then I realized the area and the region that they lived in actually was one of the main connecting points of what they call the Roman road. The Roman road was actually a thing that connected the east to the west, right? At that time, not, not our west, because it didn't go that far, but their, their west, you know what I mean? Like, and but what's interesting about that passageway is that it was a connecting of commerce. It was, uh, they traded goods, you know, and ideas, but also a lot of other stuff came. Ideologies, religions, practices. And this guy was just very open-minded. That was his thing. He was learning all of this stuff. He was intaking all this information. You know, and it was funny. I was talking to my wife this morning because this thing popped in my mind. I was like, man, sometimes you could be so open-minded that your brain falls out. And she was like, what kind of stuff are you talking about? She's like, but that was a good example. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'd just be saying random stuff. You know, I guess it's the medication. I guess it's the <laughs> But I was like, you know, sometimes we could be so open-minded that our brain falls out. We don't have any boundaries. Again, I'm not shooting down. Y'all know me. I think we need to open up, explore. In the day. But there's got to be some boundaries. Because without boundaries, without what I like to call guardrails, it gets us in trouble. It gets us in some deep trouble. And there is a lot of people nowadays that have accepted a cultural narrative of things. And they're not, a, they're not bold enough to stand up. We've accepted a cultural narrative that all paths lead to God. And you know what that does when you accept that? It discourages you from engaging and living on mission. We've accepted a cultural narrative that if you go to church you're good and you know what that does that discourages you from engaging and living on mission you know when we start accepting these cultural narratives we don't understand how it actually steals from us the fire we need to live out what the holy spirit is trying to call us to go do 
And so what cultural narrative have you accepted that has stopped you from engaging the word of God and applying the word of God to the lives of those around you? What stopped you? You know, Paul not only rebukes him, but Paul curses him. Paul curses him. Now the hand of the Lord is against you, and you are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately a mist of darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by hand. Why would Paul choose to temporarily blind a man if he had that choice? I don't know if he had that choice. He probably was just speaking the message. But the, the thing is, and I love what you shared, because I agree with it. It's so interesting how it correlates so well with his own story. It correlates perfectly with his story. He was blinded. You know, Paul understood the power of darkness. It's the same thing that happened to him. You know, I was making this joke, losing my ability to taste sweets, struggle. It has been a struggle. I've lost weight because of this. Right. And some that could be a good thing. But, you know, if you knew me back in the day, I was very skinny. I'm not trying to go back. I'm not going back. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I love sweets, man. And there's certain times of the day where I will just like just it's like automatic. I go for a cookie or a donut like I just I go. For, I don't like candy, though. There's a difference. I can't stand candy, but I love like donuts, cakes, pastries. I had to reevaluate everything, how I eat and what I eat. But here's the thing. When you lose what I like to call this, this, this sensory loss, you know what this does? This disruption forces you to reflect. Because some of the stuff you do is so automatic. I automatically, at a certain time, I go for a donut. I go for a cookie. I don't even think. And you know how many times I've done that even with this condition? that I have right now, and I'm like, oh, it's metal. <laughs> like, and then I throw it away, and Zion's like, you have been, she's like, you've been wasting so much food right now. Like, it's inflation's real, Paris. You know what I mean? Like, we ain't got it like that. You know, and so I'm like, I, because I'm, I'm eating, and, and I, it's like, I keep forgetting. I can't do that. I go make some coffee. I put sugar. Why did I do that? I, I, there's so many things that we do that's just habitual. It's just automatic. It's not even conscious. But then this thing, it forces you to like, oh, I got to reconsider everything. This disruption has caused me to reflect on a lot. My eating habits, even like the, 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 the danger of sugar. It's actually really not a good thing. Like, I just want to put that out there. You should examine that. <laughs> like, it's not good. But it's like, man, this is real. What do we do with this? Some of us are so deep in a routine that it's automatic and it's unconscious that we don't even know that we haven't been living on mission for God. We haven't been ministering to God. We haven't been allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through us. And we haven't been allowing other people to, uh, to speak into us. We don't even realize it anymore. I'm praying for us. I'm praying for us as a church. I worry about our disciples. Are they really discipling each other? I worry about our disciples. Are we really evangelizing to our friends, family, and community? I worry that rather than being like Paul and Barnabas, that we might end up more like Bar Jesus so open-minded that we've allowed the truth of God to leak out. Don't let that happen. Amen.